It's great to be back amongst friends. I've got some colleagues from Seneca. Many of you I've met at uh, GTA Lug or FSOS or other events around town. And so it's, uh, it's great to be here with you. I want to talk today about uh, FPGAs. Uh, and FPGAs in three different uh, contexts or angles. Uh, FPGAs for fun, uh, as a hobbyist, just experimenting with them and, and enjoying them. Uh, FPGAs for acceleration of workloads, and then finally FPGAs, how can you uh, maybe commercialize that technology or take advantage of that in a business context. So that's basically what I want to do today, give a bit of an intro to the FPGAs, and then talk about those three different circles. Uh, but first off, FPGAs, hardware you can code. Uh, basically, instead of sitting there with a, a lot of wires, you can sit there with a very small number of wires and uh, write uh, code to make hardware do what you want it to do. So an FPGA is uh, an acronym for Field Programmable Gate Array, which is an increasingly inaccurate uh, description of what's inside them. Um, effectively, they're a blank chip that you can uh, make into whatever you want to make them into. Um, so as an example, I've got one here, and it looks like a fairly boring, regular black piece of plastic uh, that you typically see on a circuit board. But as I just cut the power to this, this has um, no particular pattern of logic in it right now. It's, it's blank. I can set it to do um, effectively whatever I want it to do. So if you think of, of an array or uh, matrix, you kind of think of it like this. And so a field programmable gate array, we'll ignore the first part for the moment. Gate array, you'd think it's some sort of an array or matrix of gates, uh, which was true in the beginning. Uh, it's maybe a little bit less true now in that interrupting that nice even matrix, uh, you'll have in addition to the gates, uh, other blocks on there. So you've got blocks which will be math blocks You'll have uh, distributed memory throughout the chip, uh, maybe some DSP logic. Uh, so there's sort of these, these chunks that break up the even matrix, but provide significant um, enhancement to the capabilities of the device. So gate, traditionally, um, gate, AND gate, OR gate, XOR, or something like that. The logic gates here aren't, uh, the logic elements aren't really gates. Um, we've, we've sort of moved away from that. Remember I said FPGA, an increasingly inaccurate description of the device. Um, so just to, to jump back to basics here, um, basic gate stuff that you have inside uh, a chip, you've got things like AND, uh, OR, XOR, and then you've got NAND and NOR and all those types of things. In each of these cases, you've got a fairly simple set of rules. For example, with AND, you say the output is true if first input and the second input are true, assuming two inputs. So you give it two falses, you get a false. You give it a false and a true, you get a false. You give it a true and a false, you get a false. And only if both are true, you get true. Uh, similarly with OR, if either of the two inputs are true, then the output is true. So if 0, 1, one of them is true, so the output's true. Even if both of them are true, the output is true. And then XOR, if uh, the first or second input is true, but not both, then the output is true. So in this case where you've got one true, it's true, or you've got the other one being true, it's true. And if they're both true, then the output is false. But all of these could be viewed a different way. You can view this as a little lookup table with a two-bit value that selects one of four outputs from the lookup table. And that's effectively what we do inside the logic elements of a modern FPGA. We just have a lookup table in there. We load it with whatever truth table we want. And it can be AND, it can be OR, it can be XOR, it can be a combination of gates. Uh, modern FPGA has anywhere from three to five bit uh, inputs. So you've got somewhere between uh, eight and 32 values in your lookup table typically. Uh, and your output, it can be single bit or it's typically multiple bits. Um, and there's typically a uh, uh, latch in there, a type D flip-flop, um, also available in each of the logic elements. I, I say that loosely because each manufacturer tends to call their logic elements something different, and they can mean something different, 
And so it's kind of a, kind of a fuzzy thing. Uh, it makes it really difficult to compare FPGAs from different manufacturers if they're talking about uh, you know, different capacities for the logic elements and then they say they've got so many of these logic elements and then you look at it, another manufacturer, they've got different definitions and a different way of counting the capabilities of their chip. But imagine a chip that's got uh, an array, a, uh, a grid of lookup tables and then a flexible interconnection between those pieces so that you can have an input come in, it can go to a, a lookup table uh, along with, a, let's say, another input. The output of that can be fed to uh, another one of the cells and so forth. And you can combine these cells to make a particular logic pattern, a particular circuit. Uh, you can do the same thing with uh, breadboard and discrete chips and a bunch of wire. Um, but obviously, the density that you're going to get from an FPGA is much higher. So how do you set up the patterns here? There's a few options. You could potentially manually select uh, what you wanted each of those logic elements to do and figure out the truth table for that. And you could manually set up the routing. And that was done in the very, very, very early days. Um, but we're way past being able to do that in terms of complexity. Uh, you could set up a schematic. You could say, I want this circuit to work in this particular way using electronic um, notation and symbols and so forth, but that's also tediously uh, difficult for the type of complexity you have with a modern device. So what we typically do right now is write in a hardware description language, uh, which allows us to define what the hardware should do um, rather than actually defining what the hardware is. So we can say that we want certain inputs to cause certain outputs, we want uh, certain you know, state machines and so forth to be maintained inside the chip. An upcoming option, something that is, is starting to uh, gain strength, uh, is writing in a programming language. And there's things like C, uh, Python, uh, Go, and some other languages that are starting to be used to write code for FPGAs, especially uh, in an acceleration context. So I'll come back to that later, but for now we'll take a look at the, at the HDL part. So HDLs, uh, there's a few available. Uh, VHDL and Verilog are both very common. And then something called System Verilog is sort of a compound of the two. Um, sort of best of both worlds or worst of both worlds, depending on who you talk to. Um, but all of these are very common, both for chip design as well as for uh, design of FPGAs. So I want to say, and I should have said this up front, um, I'm not an FPGA expert. I'm an FPGA fanatic, uh, and I enjoy this stuff, but I'm by no means a, an expert with, uh, with FPGAs. Um, okay, so if you've written something in one of these languages, we'll come back to those in a minute, um, how do you actually get it into the chip? What does that, what does that look like? So typically, uh, you have an analysis and synthesis step. So this is kind of breaking down how the implementation works. In an IDE, Hit some control key combination and magic stuff happens. Uh, the magic stuff consists of pieces like this. So where in a, in a, if you're writing software, you would compile it and then, well, you'd you know, pre-process it, then you compile it, then you'd link it and so forth. You have this sort of thing going on with um, FPGA hardware. Analysis and synthesis. So you've got a description of what you want the circuit to do. That has to be converted into individual elements. So in order to do what you want, we're going to have to have some AND gates, we're going to have to have some multipliers, we're going to latch these values here. It needs to be broken into the logic elements that are required for your particular operation. Uh, placement and routing, uh, which some manufacturers call fitting, is then taking that uh, combination of logic elements and figuring out how to actually put that on the chip. Given the placement of the larger blocks as well as the, the smaller logic elements, um, how, you know, how are they going to be interconnected? Uh, are they all going to be stuffed in one corner of the chip or um, you, know, you need a multiplier and you've used all the multipliers in that corner of the chip, so how are you going to connect to the multiplier on the other side? That's, um, that's the fitting piece. And then a bit file or bit stream generation is basically taking that information and encoding it in a way that's particular to the chip. So the lookup tables, the interconnection information, uh, 
uh, settings for the I.O. circuitry around the edge of the device and so forth is generated um, or compiled into uh, a stream of bits that uh, can be used in different ways. So it can be downloaded dynamically on the fly to the FPGA, and that can be done over JTAG or in some cases over serial. Um, or it can be transferred to uh, a memory device, an EEPROM or something like that, that will transfer into the FPGA on power up to, uh, to initialize that. So I guess the last step, which I didn't put here, is actually getting that bit stream uh, out to the device um, in one of, those, one of those ways. Okay, so let's, let's actually take a look at um, the basics of this. And I know we've got some people in this room that know this stuff a lot better than I do, so bear with me. So what I've got here is a board from a company in the States uh, called uh, KNJN. And they're kind of a, a fun company. They produce these uh, boards which are fantastic at a hobbyist level or for getting started with FPGAs. Um, they consist of, they, they have uh, chips from different uh, manufacturers and with a range of capabilities and they start pretty economically. For a few dozen dollars you can get a board that um, allows you to you know, jump in and, um, and experiment. Um, you don't have to you know, even spend really as much as a Raspberry Pi to get started with FPGAs. So this is um, an FPGA. It's on a breakout board. Uh, I haven't even soldered all the headers on yet. Uh, so you've got the various pins to the FPGA broken out for input-output. It's got a couple of LEDs on it. It's got a push button. Uh, this other board here is a serial interface and power. So USB supplies the power and the, the serial connection. So I'm going to plug that into this laptop with a USB cable. Okay. And then this tool uh, is a tool provided by uh, Intel. And it is uh, free beer free, um, in this version at least, um, which in this crowd I know is, uh, is not a good thing because this is, I imagine, largely an open source uh, group. Uh, I myself, being an open source person, it rubs me a little bit um, the wrong way to use uh, proprietary tool chain. There are open source tool chains available for uh, a number of steps in the FPGA process, but the FPGA manufacturers uh, like to keep some details of their chips um, pretty pretty close to their chest. And so particularly the fitting uh, part of the compilation cycle is uh, a place where there are not open source tools available for most of the chips that are out there. Uh, an exception to that appears to be um, the lattice semiconductors ICE chips, um, although they tend to be on the lower end of the capability scale. Uh, so there's a full open source tool chain available there. There are some really good open source tools available for some parts of the tool chain. So it's not uncommon for uh, people to use a combination of proprietary and open source tools using, um, let's say, open source synthesis and then a proprietary fitter. Um, it's also, although IDEs are provided uh, by the vendors for their uh, chips, um, a lot of people working in the space actually use um, their own automation and scripting and so forth to drive the, uh, the process of uh, implementing a design. But this is a horribly simple uh, FPGA or a little piece of Verilog. So in here, just as to get a taste of what um, of how Verilog is written, I've got to find a module. Module's called push button. It accepts an input. So there's a wire coming in, which I've labeled PB. There's an output, which I've labeled LED. And simplest thing ever, I've just said LED is equal to PB. So if you connect PB to a push button and LED to an LED, the state of the push button should be reflected in whether the LED is on or not. Um, this is effectively a wire. <laughs> it just connects the input to the output. That's it. Um, Okay, so dirt simple, let's give it a shot. 
if all goes well, I should be able to hit Control L and magic stuff should happen. Here we go. And this will go through various steps and should tell me it worked. There we go. Yeah. So there's a couple of things that are appearing here. One is a summary on the top and then down below, which is kind of shrunk. This is the output from the various pieces of the tool chain. Um, what's happening here is, and this makes more sense perhaps if I can scroll this, we see the various pieces kicking in. Now, it, uh, the, the pop-up said that there were some warnings. Some of those warnings are just things about licensing. I haven't licensed parallel compilation because I'm cheap and I'm using the, the free toolkit here. Uh, so, you know, parallel compilation is not licensed and it's been disabled and so, so forth. Uh, some things are only available with a purchase license and so forth. Here, um, it's telling me that design constraints file are not, is not found. So the design constraints file and some of the modeling that it will be trying to do and not successfully able to do has to do with timing. If you're designing a complex circuit that's interfacing with other devices, you want to know what frequency it's going to drive the outputs with, what the slew rates are going to be, those types of things. But just as you can't really say this motor is going to run at a particular speed unless you know what that motor is driving, we can't really say that this pin is going to change states at a particular rate without knowing what it's connected to and the capacitance and so forth of the devices that are, are attached to it. And so there's information here which I have not given uh, to, the, to the software so that it can't properly model that stuff. It can't give us uh, detailed information about that. So timing information and so forth is not available. So it's gone through and it's, it's I got a couple warnings here. There's no clocks defined in this design because it's just a piece of wire. Um, but in the end, it successfully puts it together. So I'm using two pins and zero logic elements. Surprisingly, I just yeah. connected the pins together. OK, let's take a look at. the netlist. This is effectively the circuit diagram for this thing. Oh, and of course it brings it up on my other window. One second here. <laughs> it's a wire. <laughs> and zoom in on that and we have, yes, a wire. Push button connected to LED. Um, now that got downloaded to this board. It actually got downloaded by um, an Incron job. So when it noticed the output file had changed, it transferred it. This push button is backwards. This push button is off uh, when it's pressed in. It's on when it's released. So when I press that push button, ooh, you can see the LED change state. <laughs> not, not rocket science, but you can see that happening. OK, so let's, let's go one step, very, very tiny step further. Let's go back to the code here. Let's invert that particular push button. So I added the tilde here, which causes a logical inversion. I'm going to build that and download it. You see the messages coming from the system here. And the compilation was successful, a bunch of warnings, which I don't care about. And now the light is off by default. When I press the push button, it lights up. Okay, so it's basically backwards to what it was doing previously. So in this code, you can see that I'm referring to push button and LED, uh, but there's more than 100 pins on this package. And so we need to identify which is which. Uh, that's been set up as an assignment of particular names to particular pins. Uh, so in this case, I've got PB set up as pin 9, which is where the built-in push button is connected. I've got LED1 set up as pin 25, where one of the two 
built-in LEDs is connected on this board. So let's say we want to uh, change that. So if I take a look at this, and my eyes are old, so I take my glasses off. Uh, looks like pin 74 is not tied to anything. Uh, let's, let's tie it to something. Slightly larger LED here. Okay, so let's change the pin assignment. Pin 74. Hit save on that. Build it. Should build exactly the same, except that it, the fitter should be routing the output to pin 74 instead of routing it to the internal LED, pin 19 or 25, whatever that was. And we're successful. And so now we should be able to, sure enough, I don't know if it's, you can see that it's on the external LED instead of the internal. So simple enough. Um, the purpose of that demonstration was specifically to just show how simple operations can be expressed very simply. There's, it's, not, uh, it's not a lot of rocket science here. But there's no state maintained here, none whatsoever. It's just whatever the input is gets inverted and driven to the output. Um, so usually for logic you want to maintain some state. So let's take a look at another example where we have a bit of state maintained or we're uh, using clock signals or something. Um, okay, so again, I apologize for the, the small print. Hopefully it's legible to those of you who are closer at least. Um, here's a, another simple example. We've got LED blink. This is from FPGA for fun, which is the uh, KNJN's uh, kind of instructional site and with some modification. So a module called LED Blink, and it accepts a clock signal. So built on that uh, PCB, there's a 25 megahertz clock. So there's a pulse that comes in 25 million times per second. Um, there's also the push button input, which actually we're not going to use, and then the LED output. So I'm going to set up a register. I'm going to set up a, a latch so I can hold state. Um, and that register here is identified as having bits 23 down to zero. So it's 24 bit wide register, capable of counting up to 16 million. Um, I'm going to call that register a count. So this looks a lot like C, doesn't it? It's, you know, suspiciously like C. Um, as soon as you start to think of it like C, you run smack into the fact that it's actually hardware, not code, but it does look a lot like C. Um, so here I'm saying always, at the positive edge of the clock signal. So whenever that clock signal rises, I want to do something. And what I want to do is define here. I could define a multi-line block of code with the begin uh, and end, but uh, since it's just a simple single thing that I want to do, uh, I can put it on uh, the same line. So here I'm saying the counter register, this 24-bit register, and then there's what looks like less than or equal to, but it's actually a left pointing arrow. Um, I'm saying that that counter register gets loaded with the value of the counter register plus, and then there's this expression, 24 apostrophe H1. And that breaks down as to a 24 bit value. The H is hexadecimal, but it doesn't really matter because it's a one, and then the value one. So I'm saying there's a 24 bit wide value one, so 23 zeros and a one. Add that to the 24-bit uh, count value and stick that into count every time the clock signal comes. So how often is our clock signal coming? 25 million times a second. Times a second. How big is our counter? 16 million. So the counter will count up in less than a second and in 16 25 of a second it will overflow back to zero. So if I want to observe the, uh, if I want to make the LED blink, I obviously can't connect it to 25 million flash per second source. So what we're going to do is use this counter. We're going to use the highest bit of that counter. So out of the 24-bit the value, we're using bit 23, uh, the highest bit. And that should change um, roughly halfway through the count to 16 million. Um, and then it will, so it will alternate between one and zero. 
so we should get um, an output that is altering at um, yeah, probably two, maybe one and a half hertz, something like that, somewhere in that range. Um, so let's try it out. We'll compile it. So just the summary here says we're using three pins, although I'm not using push buttons, so I should probably take that out. We're using a total of uh, 24 registers and really not very much of the rest of the resources, less than 1% of the chip's resources. And when we take a look at the board, we observe that it's flashing as expected, right? The flashing LED thing, it's the almost the hello world of, uh, of FPGA programming or any hardware project. Okay, so that's, that's uh, straightforward enough. What would happen if we did something like this? What I'm going to do is AND bit 23 with bit 21. So if you picture, the first bit is alternating on, off, on, off every time you get a clock pulse, right? 12 and a half million times per second, it's on. Uh, and then Told how many times a second it turns off. The next bit up is, is alternating states at half that speed. The next bit up at half that speed again and all the way up. So the, the bit 24, bit 23, the, the highest order bit, uh, we've already said is going to change state um, a little bit more often. Uh, it's going to flash a little bit more than once per second, about two thirds of a second or so it's going to flip. But two bits to the right of that, it's going to change how, how much more often? Four times. Okay. So if we add these two values together, what do we expect to see? Divide by four. Okay, but we're adding these together. So you've got... Off for the half. And then up and down for like one eighth of a second. Yep. How many times up and down? So out of those four cycles, you've got two zeros and two ones, right? So we should be getting a double blip. Should look like a heartbeat. Let's try it out. And the compilation finished. The Incron just picked it up and it's downloading. And so you get the result as expected. It's flashing twice and then it's, and then it's pausing. Okay. So that's, again, pretty simple, pretty, uh, pretty basic um, example. We can, we can build this out. There's a couple of other things here that are kind of, uh, kind of fun. Kind of like this one. This one is again from uh, KNJN, and it's a it uses pulse width modulation to vary the brightness of the LED. They've got a free running clock uh, that's connected, to, or they've got a clock or a counter that's connected to the clock, and counts up the same as the other one. Um, but what they're doing is they're incrementing the uh, brightness of the LED to a certain point, and then when it gets to full bright, they're flipping it and they're they're bringing the brightness down. So you should get a sort of a uh, expanding, contracting kind of brightness on the LED. Give that one a whirl. How many of you um, work with electronics? You play with prototyping boards and chips and wires and those kinds of things. Okay. So Although that is only a couple lines of code, you can imagine that it is probably a pain to make out of discrete 74 series chips and, and wire up, right? Um, now, the compilation was successful. It doesn't look like it downloaded this, so I'm going to download it manually. FPGA, um, 
So the Pluto board, this is LEDs. What we've got here is a bunch of uh, the intermediate files that are produced. And then this one here is the one I care about. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to do Pluto 3 download, a uh, short script I wrote to download it. And what's it called? LED Glow. Okay, and that's transferring to the board over serial, which is not blindingly fast. And I don't know if this one is observable with the room lights, but you can see that it's sort of doing the, the pulsing thing, right? It's glowing brighter than, than dimmer. Okay, but enough with LEDs. Um, let's take a look at a piece of code that's a little more complicated. So it seems that a lot of people experimenting with FPGAs, especially I suspect people of a certain age, um, write a Pong game as one of their first FPGA projects. So uh, KNJN again has a, a sort of the, the starter code to get you started with the timing of, uh, of the Pong game. Pong game, you can, you can sort of tell who's here from the 60s and earlier and who's, you know, 70s and later by whether you recognize the Pong game. The Pong game was one of the, the first sort of TV, TV games. Uh, it was implemented in discrete logic. Uh, I think Atari did the, one of the first versions, if not the first version. Um, and it eventually became something that, you know, people bought at their local, uh, I don't know, consumers distributing or what it was back in the day, and connected up to their TV. And it was so cool that you could actually control something on your TV instead of the networks doing that for you. Um, but it was uh, basically a sort of table tennis. You had a couple of uh, controls where you could move your paddles and this little square ball bounced around. What's interesting about this and the reason that it's, it's so commonly used as sort of the, the first more interesting project for people that are experimenting with FPGAs is there's a lot of timing involved with, with video. You have to you know, control your timing fairly well, and then you also get into the challenge of drawing the image without uh, mapping it out in memory. Right? We all think in terms of, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw this particular image in memory, but you don't need to. You can generate the image on the fly. And just thinking that through is actually a really good, uh, really good exercise in getting used to FPGAs. So I took the basic code from uh, KNJN, but my interest uh, was actually in interfacing with other devices. So their code had the basic code for drawing. Where I wanted to go with it is that I wanted to uh, interface over the SPY uh, bus to another device. And I wanted to be able to do that serial communication. And so um, took this and, and expanded it to, uh, to do that. Um, without going into full depth into the code, um, basically we've got an external module, which I'll just call up because it's kind of interesting. There we go. So we've got an external module that runs off the 25 megahertz clock, and it does basically what we were doing with flashing the LEDs in terms of taking that and dividing it down to get um, the, the various signals that we need. And so uh, you've got a counter for the X position, you've got a counter for the Y position. Um, both of those get uh, tied into a divider running off the 25 megahertz clock. And uh, so that 
basically those, those two counters give us the position that the rest of the logic uses to figure out when to draw the ball, when to draw the paddle, when to draw the other pieces. Um, but it also generates the horizontal and the vertical retrace sync signals. So what we need to drive a monitor is the color data. So we need our RGB values that we're going to feed to the monitor. And then we need the synchronization signals so that uh, at a certain point in time, we bring that what used to be the cathode ray beam back to the start of the line uh, to do the next line. And then when we get to the bottom of the screen that we bring it back up to the top. So that's the horizontal and the vertical synchronization signals. Um, so we've got those signals derived from the 25 megahertz clock. And we're using VGA here because uh, you can run that at, you know, derive that from a 25 megahertz clock. To do HDMI, I would have to send the color information as digital data at a higher speed. That requires, in the case of this device, that I would uh, use a phase lock loop element to uh, get a higher clock, to multiply the clock. And you can, with a 10 times multiplier, get the clock speeds that you need in order to run HDMI. But the simpler case is, let's run this as, um, let's run this as a VGA output. And so that's, um, that's what we're going to try here. So the logic, um, basically, we're looking for certain ranges of x and y values in order to draw things on the screen. And based on where we are drawing, which pixel we're currently drawing this very moment, uh, we decide, do we draw that as black, the background? Do we draw that as the color for the border? Do we draw that as the color for the paddle? Or do we draw that as the color for the ball? And so we make various decisions about that. The position of the wall stays the same. We can just say, is it you know, between 0 and 8 pixels from the edge? That would be you know, the, the wall on this side. And you know, a certain range of pixels on a line would be the wall on the other side. Um, but for things like the ball, the ball position is uh, controlled by register that we update as, as we go. And where do we update the ball? Here's ball positioning. And so what we look for is collision. And we basically say, are we in, you know, where we're drawing the ball, is that also counted as being where we're drawing the paddle? Or where we're drawing the ball, is that also counted as being part of the wall? And if it is, then we've got a collision, and then we have to do something with that. And detecting which sides the ball is colliding on, we make a decision whether to reverse um, our horizontal offset that we're adding each time or the vertical offset that we're adding each time. And then we add that to the ball position, and um, that updates where the ball is on the screen. Paddle, similarly, we need to take, uh, we have a register that maintains the start of the paddle position, and then from there to a certain number of pixels over, that's where we're drawing the paddle. And it's only between you know, certain y values that we draw that rectangle in. Um, and we update that according to information that comes in from the, the user input device. Probably most easily done with push buttons, so you can increment and decrement that thing, but that's kind of a difficult user interface. Uh, so what I wanted to do was interface, uh, in this case, an MCP 3008 uh, analog to digital converter. It uses a SPI interface. And so in order to connect that up, um, I had to uh, derive the clock signals and the chip select signal and so forth in order to, uh, to drive that. So in this case, I thought, well, we only really need to read the ADC once per frame. Because if we read it and update more than often than once per frame, it, it doesn't matter, right? So I tied the timing of that into the, to the display. And uh, on a particular Y range of the display, I uh, am clocking out the, the clock signal for the spy bus. And that's done for, you know, basically according to the X pixel position. So it's all tied back into the, to the video timing. Um, this is what drove me crazy. Just because I'm thinking in a software mindset, but this is hardware. And uh, I would be going along, and it would be OK. And then I'd run smack into something else. So there's some interesting things in here, like in software, you can set a variable anywhere you want. You can have a bunch of different pieces of code that would set that variable, like we set it to 0 if a certain condition is true. 
in hardware, you really only can have one thing that sets a register. If you want multiple things to set that register, you've got to set up some multiplexing and so forth to make that happen. Um, so there, there was some, some significant challenges in just getting my mind around the differences uh, between software and hardware here. So once we've made decisions about uh, where we are on the screen, what we are, should be drawing at this position on the screen and so forth, then it comes to the rather simple uh, bit of outputting those values. So I'm treating the red, green, and blue values as digital values. So I have eight colors available to me. And um, it becomes pretty simple at, in the end to just say, you know, if uh, I've got a bouncing object or a ball, then turn on the red channel. If, I've got, if I'm currently drawing the border or I'm drawing the ball, turn on the green channel. If I've got a bouncing object or the ball, turn on the blue channel. So this effectively gives me, um, it was because ball is specified in all three of these, if I'm in the ball, if the current pixel being drawn is in the ball, then it should be white. All three of these channels will be turned on. Uh, if I am in the border, um, which is part of the bouncing object, it would also be white because all three would be true. But if I'm in a bouncing object that's not the border, then the red and the blue will be true, so I should have a magenta uh, paddle. Um, so this should give me the first part of, of Pong. So let's give this a whirl. Um, I'm going to unplug my FPGA, and I'm plugging it into this other board, which is a rather large prototyping board, but it's almost empty. If you come and take a look at it, you'll find that it's actually um, mostly just the VGA connector. I've also got an analog to digital converter plugged into it and a sliding paddle control. So I'm going to take this FPGA, drop it into here, and hopefully not drop it into the wrong spot on the board. go. That's right. Keep that magic smoke in the package whenever possible. Okay. Okay, let's try a build of that. We'll see what we get. Spammers will call at any time, even when you're giving presentations. Okay, so we're using slightly more resources. This FPGA is not a particularly large one. It's got 8,000 logic elements, but even still the partial pawn game that I've got so far is only using 3% of that at about 271 logic elements. Okay, so Click OK on that, and what should happen at this point is it should have downloaded. Now this is the part where I try to connect this to that screen and hopefully nothing blows up. Um, now actually I let you connect this up because I'm <laughs> almost guaranteed to plug the wrong thing in here. Always call an IT support. <laughs> now this is such a non, maybe, oh, Close, close. The right-hand side is, is off the screen here. Okay, so again, it's not, not fully implemented. This, the part here of being able to move the paddle is the part that just about drove me to distraction and which I am very pleased is working. Now, that's an agonizingly slow ball movement, right? So I did implement a difficulty control. Uh, I can make the paddle smaller and in fact, I can speed up the ball. So we have four ball speeds and four paddle sizes, and it's only slightly more difficult with its smallest paddle size and the fastest speed. So I've been spending so much time working on the ADC stuff that I haven't actually got around to things like, you know, score and that kind of thing. Um, 
sound effects, those kinds of there's yeah, there's potential to play with this for years, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, the uh, that's the the basics. So um, what we have here is in terms of lines of code, probably maybe three four screens of code. Um, in terms of complexity, it's using just a couple hundred logic elements. Um, so I could, you know, continue to experiment with this and play with it. Um, score counter would be relatively easy to implement. Drawing that as seven segment type displays would be relatively straightforward. Uh, the chip has uh, some RAM, and that RAM can be used by, you know, it can be loaded by the process, but it can also be preloaded and treated as ROM. So that gives the potential to load in a graphics pattern for characters, for numbers, for example, that would be more interesting than just sort of a seven segment number. Uh, in terms of sound effects, it would be relatively straightforward to make little beeps and bleeps um, by having you know, oscillators. You'd have to have some logic that turned off the sound uh, you know, a certain number of cycles after it had, uh, the beep had started. But again, it would also be possible and more interesting perhaps to take that memory, load it with the waveforms for you know, particular ping and pong sounds. Um, and then perhaps output those through uh, to a digital analog converter on a spy channel or I squared C interconnect, something like that. Um, so at the hobbyist level, FPGAs um, allow you to basically replace what you would implement with a whole bunch of discrete chips with just the FPGA, design the description of what you want it to do, and then fire it up. Um, it's it's after having worked with actual hardware for so many years, it's just incredibly cool to just be able to move pins around. You know, just I, I want that output to go over there, um, or to you know add circuit complexity without actually going and adding another prototyping board to your thing and a bunch more wires. Um, so on a hobbyist level, um, FPGAs are a blast. They they allow you to um, fairly inexpensively and just Looking at cost, you can get small FPGAs for under $20. Um, allow you to replace a whole bunch of discrete chips with it. And in terms of interfacing, uh, obviously you could build a device that runs on its own. But you could also interface this quite easily to a Raspberry Pi or to a PC or something like that by USB, by I squared C, by a spy. Um, lots of options uh, exist there. Okay, I'm going to go back here. Hopefully grab the right one. All right, so FPGA is for fun. Uh, boards start at under 20 bucks, um, although, you know, moderate level board might be slightly more than that. Um, so for personal experimentation, for hobbyist stuff, for building electronic circuits with fewer chips, um, Quite, quite inexpensive options. As I said, tool chains are available for free, especially for the smaller devices. Um, but that's, that's free as in free beer, not uh, free as in freedom. Um, open source tool chains exist, but the fitting stuff is something that is not readily available open source. The lattice ice uh, chips are a good option if you want to um, experiment with a smaller FPGA and you want a fully open source tool chain. Um, there's some, some good options there. And quite, uh, quite compact boards with the USB interface, you just slot them in a USB, it's almost like they're a, a flash drive, and you download to them and power them through your USB connection. Okay, so hardware. If you want to experiment with this stuff, uh, Elmwood Electronics here in town has FPGAs. Um, they're also, uh, KNJN, as I mentioned, has a great line of FPGAs. They run the FPGA for fun uh, educational website. It's not a, um, a paragon of modern web design, but they've got some, uh, some useful content, especially in uh, Verilog. And then of course, the usual suspects, Adafruit, SparkFun, uh, Seed Studio, uh, DigiKey, and it's fallen off the bottom here, Element 13, uh, all carry uh, fairly inexpensive uh, starter kits. 
so for advanced hobbyist stuff, if you want to get into FPGAs uh, sort of on a hobbyist level, but you want to do some heavier, uh, more serious stuff, uh, 96 Boards has a couple of um, a couple of options. The 96 Boards stuff are the ARM-based computers uh, from Lenaro. This device is uh, one example of that. This is the Chameleon board. Uh, and to be honest, I'm not sure that I would recommend the Chameleon board because it doesn't seem to be well supported. They kind of threw it over the fence and then didn't you know, provide good support beyond that. But it's kind of interesting that the SOC, the system on a chip, has two ARM cores in the silicon. And most of the peripherals are implemented as FPGA. So for example, there is a, an HDMI connector here. There is no graphic circuit on the SOC. The FPGA can be programmed to provide graphics capabilities, and that's what's interfaced to the HDMI connection. The same with the other peripherals. Uh, so the nice thing there is if you don't want HDMI and you want to actually use more of the FPGA to do something else, some acceleration or some custom stuff, then, then that option exists. Big brother to this board is the Ultra 96. Um, it has a similar design in that it has the, uh, the hard processor uh, on the chip, but then it's got a large FPGA area that uh, you can implement basically whatever you want as peripherals for that device, and that's all in the same package, all in one SOC. Um, I have no idea how to pronounce that. Uh, Kurt? Critical. Oh, critical, okay, critical has a snickerdoodle board, um, which is a board that has just tons of I.O. and uh, processor and so forth. And um, uh, it's a fairly interesting board. It's sort of on the higher end of uh, what you might want to experiment with at a, at a hobbyist level. And then finally, code. Uh, where do you find code? As I mentioned, FPGA for fun is a cool website. Um, but there's tons of stuff on GitHub. If you go on GitHub and you search for one of the HDL names, like Verilog, Put it, I searched for Verilog and came up with 8,000 hits on GitHub. So some of those are tools for doing stuff with Verilog, but a lot of those are interesting projects that are written in Verilog, and you can take that, run with it, experiment with it, uh, as you would open source software, you open source basically hardware designs uh, for FPGA. And one thing to mention is that there's, there are soft, soft cores, there, there are processor designs available as FPGA. Um, some of those are available on the RISC, uh, sorry, on the GitHub. Um, but there's also things like the RISC-V project, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, open source processor design. Uh, you can grab that, uh, synthesize it, and uh, uh, burn it to an FPGA. Um, in fact, there a, was a recently uh, announced board from Seed Studio, the $17, I think that might be American, $17 board that will run a RISC-V processor. Uh, in FPGA, so it's pretty interesting. Okay, on the flip side, acceleration. And here we get into sort of heavier duty uh, uses. It's interesting to use FPGAs for electronic stuff, but it's also interesting to marry an FPGA to a CPU to use it for task acceleration. So any sort of task that has large data volumes where you're doing the same operation or the same set of operations, the same algorithm against massive amounts of data um, where deep pipelining makes sense. You have a, a bunch of processes that you can run sort of back to back or where you want to run much more highly parallel than you can in a general purpose CPU. Uh, FPGA is uh, an approach worth considering for those types of things. So what does this mean? Well, effectively things like crypto, uh, things like machine learning and um, modeling whether that's financial modeling or weather modeling, those types of applications uh, can work really well on an FPGA accelerator. So uh, interconnection of FPGAs to CPUs is becoming a, a rather hot area. You probably saw the announcement, I think it was yesterday, about uh, the CXL uh, standard uh, being driven by Intel and some industry partners. Uh, it is an alternative to uh, the CCIX, it's pronounced C6 uh, initiative, which uh, has actually been, been running for a while. There's a couple of older initiatives, uh, and older in this industry is not very old, um, 
the CAPI, the open CAPI stuff from IBM, um, and the NVLink stuff, which is uh, being driven by NVIDIA. Um, I'm, I'm not really hopeful that this is actually going to go very far just because of where it's positioned, and I'm sure some of you may disagree with me on that. Um, the NVLink stuff, likewise, because it, it's sort of a single vendor standard and doesn't seem to be gaining industry consensus around it, um, that's why I've sort of uh, grayed them out. I see a lot stronger hope for, for these. So these are both, um, they're, they're competitive approaches to uh, connecting multiple CPUs and potentially uh, other types of devices such as FPGAs in such a way that each device can view main memory. Um, the alternative is where the CPU can view main memory and then it talks through a constrained PCIe bus to transfer uh, information over to an FPGA accelerator with its own memory. The problem there is to get stuff into and out of the FPGA accelerator, you're going through that narrower PCIe bus. Uh, so in both of these cases, they're talking about giving the accelerator a view of main memory, but in order to do that, you need to bring in cache coherence, right? The cache that the accelerator would have needs to be synchronized and uh, kept in sync with the, the CPU caches. Um, these standards allow you to do that. They also allow multiple CPUs to maintain cache coherence between them. Um, and we're seeing, uh, we anticipate products uh, based on this standard, which has just recently been, um, I don't want to say released because it hasn't really been released, uh, but I guess formalized. Uh, there are products based on CCIX out there right now. What's kind of interesting is that the industry seems to be dividing into two camps. You've got, uh, behind CCIX, you've got ARM and AMD and a bunch of other vendors. Um, you've got Huawei and some others. In the CXL camp, you've got Intel, uh, some of the graphics vendors, and Huawei. Um, so notice I'm mentioning Huawei. Uh, they're in both camps, and this is, this is kind of interesting. Um, they are actually, uh, they've got shipping product with the C6. Um, uh, based on the C6 standard, uh, but they're, they're part of this group as well. So we may see both standards implemented by that company. Uh, they've been doing some pretty, some pretty impressive stuff in the FPGA space, um, but also in the processor space. So I think they're, they're one to watch. Okay, profiting, using this stuff uh, commercially. So there's, there are a few options. If you want to use FPGA acceleration for what your company is doing or uh, what your startup is about to do or something like that, uh, there are lots of PCIe-based accelerators. Right now, we don't really have much product based on C6, nothing based on CXL yet. Um, that stuff will come down the pipe. PCIe-based stuff, um, you know, cards that will slot into PCIe. Um, and which typically have their own memory, you would load that through the PCIe bus. Those are readily available. Um, there's also some interesting products. This is one that, that particularly catches my attention. This product is shipping for small values of shipping. Um, it's supposed to be out there, but it's, it's to select customers only, according to Intel. It's a, it's a chip which is a Xeon processor and FPGA together in one package. Um, which, which provides some interesting possibilities. It's got a fully coherent connection. It's not based on the, the newer standards, but it's got a, a coherent connection between the two. And it's an interesting product. Um, of course, Intel bought uh, Altera some time ago, and this is sort of one of the first fruits of that, uh, of that marriage. But even without getting into your, well, actually, sorry, we'll go to the edge for a moment. Um, FPGA on the edge sounds kind of exotic, except that FPGA is now a few dollar option, right? It's a sub $10 option. And so where you can put in an FPGA and move some of your processing from the server down to the edge, where you can run some of your neural network stuff down on the edge, where you can do keyword recognition and other types of things out on the edge, and transfer less data back to the server, uh, it may make sense. So a few things that we're seeing there, we're seeing uh, M.2 
uh, form factor PCIe accelerators. So that's the form factor used for those little SSDs that you have inside laptops and so forth. A lot of single board computers now have M2 slots. And so you could take a single board computer and you could slot in an FPGA on the M2 interface and use that accelerator with the single board computer. That opens up some interesting possibilities. Um, of course, you could also, on a number of laptops now, have two M2 slots. So you could have SSD in one, you could have FPGA accelerator in the other, and you could do some interesting, interesting things there, either for development work or for you know, a high capability laptop deployment of some sort. Um, there are a number of chips that have ARM cores and FPGA uh, together. Um, there's chips from Altera and other companies um, that may be interesting for edge devices. And then standalone FPGA chips are, are cheap. Uh, they start in single digit uh, dollar prices and they go up into the hundreds of thousands depending on uh, capability that you need. I didn't mention at the beginning, but I first heard about FPGA stuff back in the 80s and I was super excited about it. The $40,000 price tag kind of turned me off. <laughs> um, and then as FPGA capabilities grew, the price tag grew with them. So it's, it's an area that I've been interested in for a long time, but it's not something I've been able to touch. But the fact that uh, we've got devices with hundreds of thousands of logic elements that are running at hundreds of megahertz to gigahertz speeds, and where the entry point is well under $100, makes it you know, really interesting in, to, to engage with this. Um, so edge product options, I talked about server product options, edge pro product options are here. This is kind of interesting, cloud. Um, I've seen some industry pundits, and unfortunately I didn't capture where this was, some industry pundits have said that they expect up to 20% of cloud in the next couple of years to have FPGA acceleration available. Uh, Amazon sort of led the charge here. Their F1 instances have FPGA acceleration. Um, I believe it's with Xilinx that they're, that they're working. They had to solve some interesting problems there, like if you've got multiple tenants on a machine, how do you share the FPGA or how do you keep the FPGA from being shared? There's you know, some challenges there. How do you make sure that the uh, bitstream that defines what the FPGA is going to do didn't get uh, corrupted either accidentally or maliciously on the way to the, you know, being run in that instance. So there's a bunch of things they've had to work through, but you can currently right now uh, rent Amazon Cloud with FPGA acceleration. So if you've got the type of workload where that makes sense without even buying your own stuff, you can uh, run that in Amazon's Cloud with that acceleration. And look at this. These names may not be household names, but they are definitely massive companies. Tencent, Alibaba, Beidou, Huawei uh, are all, um, they all have public cloud offerings in China with FPG acceleration. So there's, uh, there's definitely some stuff happening there. There will probably be more um, cloud providers offering FPGA stuff over the next year or two. Next, interesting thing um, that I see as sort of the next step in, in FPGA stuff, um, whether in the cloud or uh, on-premise server context, I expect that there's gonna be a lot more integration with regular code. Early attempts at running C and other traditional languages on FPGAs were pretty limited because you ended up with effectively a fairly inefficient state machine interpreting the C code. Um, but what we've, what we've seen more recently is uh, some newer projects that are using languages that are a lot less sequential um, or, or have the capability to run much more parallel um, being used to prepare code for an FPGA and then fairly, not, not to the point I'd like to see yet, but fairly transparently connecting the code that's running on the processor to the code that's running in the FPGA. Where I would like to see this go is that you could just mark certain compilation units and say this runs on the FPGA, the rest of the application runs on the CPU, and just magic stuff happens, right? It would take that, it would 
uh, synthesize it, it would produce the, the bit stream for the FPGA and all the scaffolding, the remote procedure calls and so on to handle that as well as the you know, consistent view of memory would be taken care of for you by the tool chain. Um, and it's my hope that we'll see that sometime in uh, these next few years. A couple of things to watch, reconfigure.io is a company that is doing some interesting work with Golang and uh, they're headed towards this. Um, still fairly early days, but they've, they've had a good level of success. Um, there are a couple of other initiatives that are at, at various stages um, in terms of sort of realizing this, uh, this dream of acceleration. 